You're listening to The Bob Zadek Show, a full hour of libertarian discussion with the smartest guests on radio. Live, spontaneous, and thoughtful. It's the show of ideas, not attitude. Now, your host, Bob Zadek. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Bob Zadek Show, the longest-running live libertarian talk radio show on all of radio. Every Sunday morning, we we are here with uh, ideas never once attitude. We are the show of ideas. We don't uh, encourage attitude one tiny bit. Thank you so much for listening this Sunday morning. I'd like to open today's show with a provocative question uh, that occurred to me as I learned uh, from this morning's guest, whom I will introduce in a moment, as I learned from her writings. Uh, The question is the provocative question, which will be lurking in the background for the next hour is, and my friends, it is a hard question, at least it is to me, is it ever acceptable, is it ever appropriate for our government to lie to us. More specifically, if government perceives that and concludes with a very high level of confidence that it is correct, that a course of conduct which government must undertake is essential for the continued well-being of the country. Think of Iraq weapons of mass destruction, and the like. Assuming that government has concluded we must attack Iraq. Assuming government concludes that there is not likely to be the groundswell of support for that that is essential for the mission to succeed. Government just says the country will never be behind us irrespective of how we uh, recite the facts. Therefore, in order to get the country behind us so that we can succeed in our mission, we must lie to them. We must manipulate the country. We must withhold facts and state facts that are not really true in order to get the country behind us so that we can succeed in this mission. Is it proper for the government to undertake that, or is the government's primary duty, primary duty, to always be honest with the public, tell them the truth, and make no attempt to manipulate them in any way? That is the question that I found myself wondering about over and over again as I learned uh, from the book written by this morning's guest. With that introduction, I'm delighted and and honored to welcome to the show this morning, uh, Abigail Hall. Uh, Abby is an associate professor of economics. Uh, Significantly, her scholarship is in economics, not in politics. That will become important to us during the hour. She is an associate professor of economics at at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. She is an affiliated scholar with Mercatus Center at George Mason. Um, She's also a scholar with the Foundation for Economic Education, aka Fee. She's also a senior fellow at the Pegasus Institute in Louisville, and also a research fellow with the Independent Institute, one of my very favorite think tanks located in Oakland, California. Uh, Abby holds her PhD in economics from GMU. The book which we will spend the next hour discussing and learning from is her recent book, which she has co-authored with Christopher Coyne, is Manufacturing Militarism, subtitled U.S. Government Propaganda. There's a loaded word. U.S. Government Propaganda in the War on Terror. Abby, welcome to the show this morning, and thank you in advance for that book and for the provocative questions you raise. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, Abby, the book title, Manufacturing Militarism, 
U.S. government propaganda in the war on terror. Let's start with the following multi-part but not complex question. Who is the manufacturer of the militarism? What is militarism as you use it in the book? And what is propaganda as used in the subtitle? So a few different things to, to latch onto there. So when we talk about militarism, what we're referring to is this tendency toward and this putting the military or putting the structure of the military up on a pedestal. And for a lot of individuals, for a lot of agencies, this tendency to try to move toward this military structure. I mean, really, in a lot of cases, placing the military beyond reproach um, and adopting progressively more military or militaristic characteristics over time. So recognizing that that is a relatively... uh, broad definition or not necessarily one that's particularly clear. Um, Militarism is actually remarkably difficult uh, to pin down and define. But in terms of who is manufacturing this militarism, that answer, at least in the book when we discuss it, would be members of the national security state. Uh, And what do we mean by propaganda? Uh, Once again, in terms of defining definitions, there are lots of people who can have, and I am sure will quibble with us on the definition that we employ. Um, but propaganda almost universally in a contemporary context has a negative connotation. And so we adopt that as well. Um, but for our purposes, propaganda has to satisfy three criteria. So first, it is purposefully biased, misleading, or false information. Uh, second, It is used to promote some sort of political cause. And third, it's bad from the perspective of the recipient because it inhibits them from engaging in rational decision-making. So that's the definition that we employ. And then we take this definition and we develop a framework for understanding propaganda within the context of democracies. And uh, your book um, draws attention to the many ways in which government or those militaristic segments of government uh, have used uh, misleading statements, perhaps outright misstatements, propaganda, as you have defined it, have used propaganda to promote militarism. Um, And you are in the book, I think this is a fair summary, uh, if not, please correct me, that government has been using propaganda, which is a negative word, obviously, misleading, misstating, uh, being uh, untruthful, using propaganda to promote militarism. Now, one of the questions I had, Abby, um, in learning from the book is you are hoping to draw the public's attention to these this bad behavior, this promoting propaganda for a militaristic end. Would you be writing this book? Would you be complaining if, for example, government, a different government than we have to be sure, government used propaganda to promote the uh, disarming of the world uh, to discourage military force if government was using propaganda, your definition, to promote free markets, limited government, federalism? Is it the use of propaganda per se that you object to or the use of propaganda for to promote militarism? Is propaganda ever something you could support if propaganda was in furtherance of ends you support? So propaganda in and of itself is a tool to be despised. And propaganda used to promote the types of ends that it has been used to promote is particularly nefarious. 
So in thinking about the question you just asked, and then also thinking about the question that you opened with up at the top of the hour, this idea of, well, what if propaganda is being used to promote some kind of, quote unquote, good end, however we want to define good, um, or what is oftentimes referred to as the idea of a noble lie or noble deception. So we can think about this within a number of contexts. Um, I think there's a quote in the book that we look to pointing out that, look, there may be different people who can handle different types of information. So I'm not going to explain something to my toddler in the same way that I'd explain it to my college students, and I would tell different information to, say, maybe my colleagues or something like that. And so the argument would go that in a similar way, sometimes maybe government needs to, to lie to its citizens in order to achieve particular ends. Um, but there's a problem. Actually, there are three problems with thinking about propaganda in this way. Um, the first problem is that there's absolutely no reason for us to believe that the incentives exist so that individuals within government will consistently promote these good or noble outcomes over time. Um, in fact, one of the things that we point out over and over again in the book is that there's actually the complete opposite incentive for people within particularly this security state uh, to try to protect this monopoly control that they have over information. Um, and so essentially by granting officials the opportunity or empowering them to try to achieve these noble ends, we also simultaneously empower them to achieve these ignoble ends. Um, the second issue with this idea of noble deception or noble propaganda um, is that it assumes that individuals are unable to process information and to act upon truthful information. Um, it may be possible that that's the case, but there's absolutely no reason for us to believe that that is actually the case. But what we have now is a scenario where citizens are effectively unable to, they're prevented from getting the necessary information that they need to be able to make an informed opinion or an informed decision. Um, and then the last reason that this is particularly problematic um, is because it actually fundamentally neglects the damage that propaganda does to the foundations of a free society. So mentioning the idea of would you be talking about propaganda if it was being used to promote liberal causes? Um, but propaganda is fundamentally illiberal. Um, its entire purpose is to cloud or to obfuscate reality. And so that those types of behaviors, whether they are done for either done benevolently or they're done malevolently, um, ultimately work to undermine those foundations of a free society that we're purporting to want to uh, promote. Now, rather than continue the conversation in the abstract, uh, your book is so valuable in giving the tangible examples. Uh, of course, Iraq, you mentioned um, uh, the story of Pat Tillman, which we might get into uh, during this hour. So pick any one of the examples in your book and use that as, if you will, the poster child as the example, as the clearest example of the government using propaganda, as defined earlier in the show, using propaganda to promote militarism um, and to uh, subtitle manipulate the American public. Okay, so it might be helpful for me to put the chapters in context and then I'll definitely go into a, a case study in, in more detail. So what we do in the book is we produce this or we present this idea of propaganda, we define it, and then out a framework for understanding propaganda within democracy. In particular, understanding propaganda within the context of a democratic society and a democratic system, and the, how the, some of the features of a democratic society may actually make us as members or as members of a democratic society, particularly susceptible to propaganda. 
So we take that framework and then we apply it to a number of case studies in the post-9-11 context. Some of those chapters are looking at propaganda as a means to foster a particular uh, policy choice. So namely, like the war in Iraq, for example, we dedicate two chapters to that. So the pre-invasion and then the post-invasion. Um, but then we also dedicate several chapters to looking at this fostering of a broader culture of militarism um, as a result of propaganda. And so with that, uh, we look at things like the use of paid patriotism, so related to propaganda and sport. You mentioned Pat Tillman, um, which is included in that chapter. We also look at the use of propaganda in film. And then we also look at the use of propaganda in terms of the Transportation Security Administration or the TSA. So that's that's the example that I'll, I'll hone in on in more detail. So when we think about flying, um, assuming we're flying, as I tell my students now, like in the before time, before the pandemic where people got on place. So if you think about flying now, imagine what happens. So let's say that you're in... New York, you get on the subway, the MTA is blasting, you know, see something, say something over the, the speaker. You get to the airport, you arrive, it's the same thing, and then here's the TSA. What you are receiving over and over and over again is this consistent message that flying is unsafe, terrorism is a real and salient threat and it is necessary for not only citizens to be hypervigilant, but for the TSA to be there to search your person, to search your property, um, sometimes multiple times, in order to keep you safe. So that's the message, is that you're unsafe and government is the solution to the problem. So when we take a look at what is being put out to the American public versus the reality, we start to see something very, very different. So within this chapter, we build on the work of a number of different individuals, particularly the work of John Mueller at Ohio State University and the Cato Institute, who's done some remarkable work, um, particularly along uh, with his uh, co-author, Mark Stewart, looking at the relative risk of things like terrorism. And what they find is that the risk of terrorism to someone in the United States is remarkably low. What do I mean by remarkably low? You're more likely to be killed by a dog or by bee stings than you are to be killed in an act of terrorism. This is true even within the context of 9-11. In fact, you could repeat 9-11 over and over and over again for like, several years, and it would still not even register on the top 10, like, number of, uh, or top 10 in terms of causes of death for the U.S. public. So we walk through that, and then after that, what we do is we discuss the incidents, the incidents that have occurred post 9-11. So think like the underwear bomber, think the shoe bomber. There are a few instances that we can look at in detail as being thought of as having quote unquote targeted or had to do with an airport or an airline. So we walk through each of those. We talk about the security measures that are implemented after that. So think things like the body scanners, think things like taking off your shoes. Uh, if you don't have TSA pre-check, like every time you have to scan your shoes before you go through. So we talk about the incidents that inspired those. And then again, we talk about whether or not the policies that have been put in place um, are actually effective or not. Uh, we spend a good amount of time talking about the body scanners. We also spend a decent amount of time talking about the federal air marshals program. And we see the same type of thing over and over and over again, that the reality of the actual threat is remarkably small. Um, in some cases, not really statistically different from zero. But the language that is being used or the message that is being sent is one that you are not safe, uh, your families are not safe, and government and its agents and its policies are necessary in order to protect you. So is, uh, is the 
the, the mere existence of the security theater, a.k.a. TSA, is its creation and existence, is that in and of itself propaganda? So in terms of is its very existence propaganda, I don't think that you could say maybe that security is all security theater or that it's all necessarily bad. Um, I mean, we had security at airports prior to the Transportation Security Administration. Um, And in fact, the data suggests that that uh, pre-2000 security actually performed better than our contemporary TSA. I don't think that that necessarily the existence of something like the TSA is in and of itself propaganda. But in its current incarnation, I would say that it is absolutely uh, an agency that is largely predicated on a propagandist message. So you wouldn't go so far as to say TSA itself is an example of propaganda, but rather it does cause as government's reminder of something which probably isn't even true, which is you are in great danger. And thank heaven we have uh, a benevolent government to protect us. Now, you mentioned the book is wonderful in explaining all of the tools, kind of scary, but fascinating, that government has always used in order to promote its governmental point of view. And of course, you mention, um, and you do a wonderful job discussing the government's relationship to the motion picture industry. Uh, it was fascinating. Uh, summarize that strange relationship between government and movie making. And Abby, when you do, I'll just mention that um, about five years ago, I just stumbled upon a wonderful documentary called, I think it was something like uh, Five Who Returned. And it was about five movie directors, Capra um, and four others um, who went about who visit who spent the time overseas during World War II filming the armies and the armed forces activities. It was a wonderful documentary. Uh, but but tell us that relationship because it is so important in our everyday lives. When we go to the theater, we don't realize that we are being indoctrinated by our government in a way that we are not, uh, that has not been explained to us. So help us understand that very strange symbiotic relationship between the motion picture industry and the federal government. So this chapter was probably one of my favorite chapters to research, um, but it was also one of the chapters where I found myself just consistently getting very angry um, because I had no idea that the relationship that I'm about to tell you about was one that existed um, and has existed for so long. So I'll start maybe with with an example and then talk a bit more about what it is that we cover in the chapter in more detail. So um, really well-known children's program. My guess would be is that probably a lot of listeners maybe watch this at some point, either themselves or maybe with their kids. Lassie, right? So we all know Lassie and Timmy, and Lassie is always there to save the day. There was an episode of Lassie where the uh, our canine heroine um, was going to be solving a mystery regarding a military aircraft. Um, the military aircraft was supposed to crash, and Lassie, through her work, was going to figure out that a design flaw in this military aircraft had uh, caused, caused this plane to crash. Um, However, this script of Lassie was sent to the powers that be at the DOD because they were requesting support for for the show. And in response to sending in this script, the folks at the DOD said, "We, we don't like this. They didn't like the way that it was being portrayed that there was a design flaw in one of their aircraft. And so they insisted on having the script changed or wouldn't offer their support unless the script was changed. 
And so instead of the plane being brought down by a design flaw, instead it was uncontrollable icing on the wing of the aircraft. So it completely changed the storyline. But this is the storyline that ran. So it wasn't anything that the military had done. It was something that was beyond their control. So this dynamic of sending scripts to the Department of Defense for commentary and then changing scripts um, to reflect the DOD's preferences is something that not only happens, but if you want to make a film today in the United States that has any kind of military hardware involved, basically, if you want to be profitable, you're going to essentially need the DOD support. So if we start looking back at the relationship between the Department of Defense and Hollywood, we have to go back really, really far. Um, In fact, the film The Birth of a Nation, so 1915, um, if that film is ringing a bell, is because it's now um, an infamous film which portrays the Ku Klux Klan or the KKK as this um, you know, crime-fighting group of heroes. Um, but what you might not know about that movie is that it was only made possible through the use of equipment and cadets from the United States Military Academy at West Point. So starting from there, you start to see this relationship develop between Hollywood and the Department of Defense. Um, we see through the uh, war, World War I, particularly World War II, you see this uh, intense cooperation. There is um, a guide that comes out suggesting how it is that Hollywood film studios portray different aspects of the war. Um, for instance, talking about portraying people who don't uh, follow the uh, government's guidelines in terms of things like rationing uh, as being the equivalent of the enemy. Same thing for people who engaged in black market transactions, um, that they were basically against the war effort. And then you move into the Cold War period, where these relationships that have already been established continue to solidify. So now what you have, and I'm glossing over quite a bit of of detail here, but folks can get the idea. What you have now is this relationship where if I am making a movie and let's say that I want to have military aircraft or I want to have a tank or something like that, I can get that equipment from the U.S. military, sometimes without having to pay for it, but I have to submit my script to them and ask them if it's okay. And they can then make suggestions about what they like and what they don't like. And so you will see things like entire plot lines being changed. So the last example at the beginning, entire characters being changed or scrubbed, um, including sometimes eliminating elements which are an absolute matter of historical fact, but don't make the military look good. So this is taking place in a variety of things that people have probably seen. So children's programming. So Lassie is just but one example. Um, Everything from cooking shows. So if you've watched as my husband and I have quite frequently, things like Gordon Ramsay and his cooking shows, they've been subjected to this process or have uh, engaged in this process. If you've seen the Transformers movies, uh, they feature a cornucopia of military hardware, and they have also been through this process. Um, Unless we think that this is something where uh, films that are critical of the U.S. military still get through, uh, the person who's now since retired, but we talk about quite de- in quite about quite a bit of detail. Excuse me, in the book is Phil Strub, and he's on record as saying that he won't offer his support to films or other projects that are critical of the military. So, in putting a bow on this or thinking about what this means from the perspective of someone who is taking in this type of entertainment, you don't get any kind of thoughtful or critical messages about the U.S. military or U.S. foreign policy 
or it makes it exponentially more difficult to make those kinds of thoughtful projects. But oftentimes, and not only that, but oftentimes, or I would say probably most of the time, when people are sitting in films or people are watching TV, you're not paying any attention to the tiny little credits at the back, assuming that the DOD is mentioned or thanked. Um, you're not paying attention. And so ultimately, people don't know that this is happening and is a big part of the media that they're consuming. Now, a couple of a couple of thoughts come to mind. Let us imagine that uh, a Hollywood project has as its plot line something involving a Boeing aircraft. Many movies have this aircraft as a central feature. So this um, project involves a Boeing aircraft. Uh, and they would love to have access to the inner workings of Boeing, the factory, the head office, whatever, uh, for the purpose of enhancing the quality of the movie. And they approach Boeing and Boeing says, well, sure, we will give you lots of valuable access, which is worth money to you, you the producers of the movie, in exchange uh, we want to take a glance at the script. We don't want to be harming our company. And Boeing does that and makes requests and says, okay, uh, we're going to jiggle with the script a little bit so we come out looking a little bit better. And the producers of the movie make a crass economic judgment. The compromise in the quality of the storyline um, is worth X dollars. The value of what Boeing is giving us is worth much more than that. Therefore, as a pure dollars and cents, no lofty uh, principles involved, as dollars and cents, the producers say it's worth it. And they do it. Um, I don't think um, you would use the word propaganda to, to describe Boeing's behavior, they're behaving in their economic self-interest, as are the producers. So why, if I'm right about my assumption, why is the behavior of Boeing, if it is, I'm not suggesting you have to reach my conclusion, why is the behavior of Boeing benign, simply economic, it's a business decision, and yet the behavior of the government um, offends you um, and prompts the use of the word propaganda. Help us understand the principle that causes you to reach two different conclusions. So, because that principle is important in the storyline of your book. Yeah, so I would say that a, a couple of things there are are important to note. So the, the incentives facing the DOD are clear um, because just like you, like if somebody comes to me and they're like, Hey, um, we'd like to write this movie, which for some reason, it, I mean, if anybody wants to write a movie about me, it would be a box office flop because I'm really boring. Um, but if somebody came to me and they're like, Hey, I'd be like, well, you know, I'd, I'd lend you my support, but I don't want to look terrible in your movie. That's understandable. Um, it's also completely understandable from the perspective of the producers of the film, because you're right, at the end of the day, they're in this game to make money. And so if getting military aircraft is essential to making their movie marketable and profitable, then they have an incentive to acquiesce to what it is that the DOD is wanting to do. I think the primary difference between what you're talking about with respect to your example with Boeing and the U.S. military is that the private company in question is not the group that is attempting to or executing U.S. foreign policy. And so one of the things that is really important here to think about um, is this distinction or these different groups that are relevant for us to discuss. Um, there are some people, by the way, who would say that that example that you just laid out is an example of propaganda. So one thing that is important, and we do note in the book, um, is that our definition is one that people may not agree with, um, but we also don't deny that propaganda might not exist in other contexts. 
there are people who argue, for example, that all advertising is propaganda. Um, and I don't think that's a particularly helpful definition because it explains everything and nothing at the same time. Um, but there are people who do do make that argument. Um, we don't deny that that is the case, that propaganda can come from other areas, um, but we limit our focus to looking at government propaganda. The government, from your book, has a different relationship with its audience than does the rest of society, business and the like, and unions, etc. So government has a different relationship, inherently different, because government is, of course, as we often say, the only institution that is allowed, uh, if not encouraged, to kill people. Um, other elements besides other than government do not have that privilege or that exemption. Now, so the government has information, as you mentioned on the show, and you also mentioned uh, with great emphasis in your book, the government often has exclusive access to information. And, and that information affects public opinion and therefore affects the vote and therefore uh, applying what you do in your book. And as an economist, you apply all the time is what's called public choice theory, which is governmental actors behave in their own self-interest, just like non-governmental actors. And of course, I'm simplifying. But the question is, so now you have government about to make a decision. Um, let's take, because it's so it's still in everybody's memory, I believe, the issue of uh, WMD, um, does uh, Iraq have weapons of mass destruction? And if they do, what should be done about it? That was a broad question, which we were discussing a couple of decades ago to justify governmental behavior. Now, is the duty of government, government has information, imperfect imprecise. It believes one set of information, but there is somewhat persuasive information the other way. Is the duty of government, if government were to follow the uh, encouragement in your book um, and the message in your book, is the duty of government, government believes the weapons exist and military action is called for. Is government's duty to present, think like a trial, a judicial trial, to present to the public balanced information. Here is the information for, here is all of the information, nothing being withheld except for classified information against, we think, this information requires military action, and we ask for broad public support. Is that the behavior, uh, assuming that in doing so, government strongly believes the public better be behind military action? The good faith belief that military action is required, should government take the chance that the public will not be behind that action, and they will be, through the political process, uh, discouraged from taking action that they believe in performing the job they were elected or hired to do. They have to behave in a way different than they believe is in the best interest because the public didn't support them. Is the government's job to present balanced information or to try to make their case as if they are the prosecutor trying to persuade a jury that the defendant is guilty. So let me let me pull that back a little bit, because um, you mentioned the framework. You mentioned that we draw very heavily on public choice. And so what I'd like to do and um, to get to the answer to that question is to talk a little bit more about the framework that we develop and particularly what we're responding to within the literature. So when people talk about, and when I say people, I'm meaning within like academic discourse, um, but also too within broad public discourse, because this is how a lot of people genuinely picture the functioning of democratic government. So in an ideal democratic government, 
you have different groups, as you mentioned. So we can think about voters, elected officials. We can also think about uh, bureaucracies or bureaucratic agents, a variety of special interest groups and so on. When we characterize, when we think about democratic engagement, there's this presumption that information is what's referred to as symmetric. So officials have information. Voters know that these officials have this information. And they know that we know. So everybody's on the same page in terms of who has what information, and everybody knows that this information is possessed by the other party. The other things that we assume are that there are appropriate mechanisms in place to reward good behavior and to punish bad behavior or deviations from what it is that the uh, relevant group wants. So, for example, we think about the voting booth as being a disciplinary tool so that voters can reward politicians for doing what it is that they want, but then also punish politicians for not doing what they want so we can vote people out of office. There are presumed to be similar mechanisms in other relationships as well. So we think about this often within the context of politicians or elected officials being able to effectively discipline bureaucrats or government bureaus. But the reality of the situation is that information is not symmetric. Um, and in fact, these disciplinary mechanisms may be weak or may not actually work very well at all. Um, so voting actually may be a relatively weak check. There are a variety of different reasons why uh, politicians may not be able to effectively discipline bureaucrats if they don't behave particularly well. So you have what are called overlapping uh, these asymmetric information problems. So as opposed to everybody knowing this information, it's really lopsided. You add on to that within the context of defense and national security, this layer of secrecy. So you mentioned security classification, which is something that we go into in more detail in the book, talking about that system, its original intention, and then what it is now. So essentially, World War II, you have this change where now it's much, much easier to classify information. And so things which you'd have a really difficult time making the argument that they are actually sensitive pieces of information wind up being, being classified. So you now wind up with a scenario where government effectively has this monopoly control over this information. They are able to prevent the citizenry from obtaining that information or they're purposefully obfuscating it. So maybe they do release information, but they only release a piece of it or they only release it so many years post. And then they can say, oh, well, that, dec that data is a decade old. So it's better now. Um, and we have examples of this throughout the book. We see stuff like that all the time. And so taking this then to your question, particularly to the case of Iraq, if we are wanting to function within a democratic system, the information is prevented and the job of the government is to do what it is that is in the best interest of the citizens, but the citizens know what is in their best interest. And so we talk about the case of Iraq, for instance, and you mentioned um, like the weapons of mass destruction you mentioned earlier that we actually apply uh, to, or we offer two different discussions of the war in Iraq. So pre-war and post in post invasion. And in that first chapter, we discuss the primary arguments that were used for invading Iraq. So discussions about Saddam Hussein having close ties to uh, terrorist organizations, particularly Al-Qaeda, which um, on its face is just absurd because he was a secularist. And so the idea that he was in cahoots with this group was just um, kind of bonkers, if you think about it. Um, that was known at the time, by the way. One of the things that's important throughout this whole exercise is that we present the information as was known at that period of time, um, not looking at it 20, 20 years post. Um, but particularly in talking about 
things like aluminum tubes and weapons of mass destruction. Within the security state, there was this large pushback, um, this discussion that there is no evidence that Saddam Hussein possessed weapons of mass destruction prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Um, We spent some time talking about maybe what the incentives were facing some of the actors who are responsible for or interested in making that particular decision. Um, And so in terms of thinking things like uh, a good faith effort, because the example people would flip back on me and say, well, assume that it's, you know, people are are genuine and that they thought he had weapons of mass destruction with that. Does that make a difference? You provide the information. And if that information turns out to be correct and you do the right thing, you being the elected official, you're rewarded for that. And if you don't, then then you're punished. But what the obfuscation does or what the propaganda does is effectively prevents that information from being shared in the first place and then prevents people from making informed decisions. The, the quandary I have um, is that uh, the... And I agree with the premise of the book, so I'm not challenging it in any way. Uh, I agree with the conclusions, the premise. um, But the problem I have is uh, it puts an awful lot of faith in the collective judgment of the voters. And as you have mentioned in the books, and as you know, as of course, and as you teach uh, in economics, that... uh, Voters have uh, make a rational decision that it makes no sense for them to spend countless hours poring over uh, foreign policy papers in order to figure out the right foreign policy, which means in part militaristic decisions. After all, I hired guys, I voted guys into office or gals. I hired people into office to do that for me. I outsource that decision making so I can go play golf. Um, so, uh, so the government having been hired to do the best it can, it says, okay, we are hired to do the best we can. We have to, we believe in good faith, not for self-interest, but there's always self-interest, public choice. But we believe the national interest, our job, requires us to invade Iraq. And if we attempt to educate the public, we will fail. We will lose their attention span. So we have to, because we are just trying to do the job we are elected to do, to do the best we can. The best we can is to invade Iraq. And the way to get the public behind us is to propagandize. For it to be wrong to propagandize would be to undo that they are hired to do their job. And the voter says collectively, don't get us involved at that level. I, I, I get worried about giving too much power, if you will, to the voters who have, who make collectively, including me, a rational decision not to wallow in foreign policy matters and just to have others who I have hired do the job. So I I worry about giving too much power to an uninformed electorate. And that's where I crash into my own support of your position. Now, we have only a, I'm raising what may be a semester's worth of conversation in um, (laughs) and needing about uh, a 45 second response. And for that, I apologize. But I warned you in advance, I'm hooked on your book. And therefore, it's hard for me to stop talking about it. But if you can give us a really brief response to that, I would sure appreciate it. Okay, I'll do my best. So um, in terms of talking about the idea of rational ignorance of voters, if people are interested in a really nice, concise, readable book on that issue, I cannot suggest highly enough Brian Kaplan's Myth of the Rational Voter. Um, Brian was on my show to talk about that book. Thank you. Well, then, 
they can listen they can listen to the show and they can get the book and they can get a, a nice idea of, of what we're talking about there in more detail. I would go a couple of directions here. So the first thing is that in terms of we we being the government need to propagandize in order to convince the citizenry because it's in their best interest and we're just trying to do our job. I'd refer again to the discussion that we engage with earlier in the book, again, about that idea of noble deception. Not only what we already discussed in terms of that makes the assumption that for whatever reason, voters or the broader public uh, can't handle information, can't process it, can't make decisions and so on. Um, I would also too, well known to probably listeners of this particular program, um, I would also think about uh, what we learn in, or what Hayek talked about in Chapter 10 of The Road to Serfdom in terms of who are the people who are likely going to be putting out this information? Is it likely that they are going to be uh, the people who are going to have the best interest of the public at heart, or are they not? Um, I think we don't have to stretch too far to think that it's probably the latter as opposed to the former. But the other way that I'd answer that question very quickly, um, and it's appropriate because it's for the, the end of the book in the last chapter, um, is we do put a huge emphasis and a very large burden on the citizenry, ultimately. So we conclude the book by looking at four different... Abby, we, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to just remind the audience um, about your book, if you may. I'm sorry to have to do this, sure. but I want to be sure they are aware of the book. So uh, this is Bob Zadig. I've been speaking with Abby Hall, who has written an important book, Manufacturing Militarism, U.S. Government Propaganda in the War on Terror. It is a book which is provocative, which will invite you, if not urge you to think about weighty subjects that I promise you, you have never thought about before. Uh, Abby's book is a must read. It'll get you off on an intellectual journey you will love. So Abby, I'm sorry to have to cut you off, but I wanted to be sure the audience all has your book in their mind as they go about their life for the rest of this weekend. If they read the conclusion, they'll find out everything I was about to say. So no worry. Thank you so much, Abby. Thank you for your time. And thank you to my friends out there. This is Bob Zadig saying thanks again to Abigail Hall. And let's hope 2022 promises us lots of relief, good health, and economic success. Happy New Year to everybody. And thanks again to Abby. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it.